All right. Hello, good people. Good morning. That was an amazing way to begin this, this second day of the summit. So uh, Mr. Ben Briquette and I are going to convince you that even the commodities title can be anti-racist. It seems like a lost cause, I know, but it has an important history that is a precedent for us today. So let me, let me give you the story, and then Mr. Burkett will share his wisdom on how to apply it to the important work of the Federation in this summit. So the secret of the Farm Bill is actually the old secret crisis of surplus. I know that seems shocking because food scarcity is our problem and food justice is about feeding the people. But in fact, the US government has a long history of deploying commodity crop surplus for its imperial dimensions. And so just looking at the archive, as the US was expanding in the Americas, they thought of commodity crop surplus as a burden, but also as the plumage of empire. But it wasn't until World War I where the government actually incentivized farmers to plow up the prairie grass and grow a ton of wheat beyond domestic consumption for the European theater of war. And Europe and Middle East who were fighting needed the wheat and so prices were high. And so farmers, what do farmers do when prices are high? They plant more and they plant it and they plant, they plowed up that deep rooted prairie grass and planted more and more and more wheat. And then the survivors of World War I got out of the trenches, went back to their own farms and planted their own wheat. And there was too much wheat on the global market. And what happens? Prices go down. And what do farmers do when prices go down? They plant more because they have a loan to pay off. This is, this is the missing link. So they planted more and more and more, and then prices collapsed in 1919. And so all these farmers, white male farmers, but a whole political spectrum, communists to capitalists, small scale to the rich, all gathered in DC and said, you got us into this mess, government, you get us out. You told us to plant a lot for feeding the war, and now our prices have collapsed. And so for all of the 20s, they organized, meanwhile, farm closures, bankruptcy, what began as a farm crisis became the entire Great Depression, infected the whole world. And meanwhile, the ecological dimensions of that overproduction became clear when millions of acres of topsoil went into the air. And when you go to the USDA now and say, how did the farm bill start? They say, when dust hit FDR's desk. It was the Dust Bowl. It was an ecological disaster made by agricultural overproduction and imperial designs by the US government. So now you've got the 1930s, and because of this movement of farmers demanding that the government actually right the wrong of telling them to plow up all that prairie grass, the 1933 Agricultural Adjustment Act began. And so this was the first farm bill. On one hand, it was an honest recognition of the economic and the ecological ravages of capitalism unfettered, of overproduction. On the other hand, it was racist in implementation because the Southern planters made sure that the tenant farmers and the sharecroppers did not get that government support. So it was on one hand an inspiring, honest recognition and racist in its implication. But when you go back to the origin of the, all these uh, original farm bills, they say the purpose was to remove or dispose surplus to stabilize the markets. Now, there was surplus still happening, even though the supply management was actually trying to contain it. But part of the government thought, you know what, we can deploy the surplus to have the US all of a sudden be even more of an imperial power. So they were deploying their food aid to Puerto Rico and these other neo-colonial territories to inculcate dependence and inculcate kind of a feeling of, you know, falling into nationalism and the US theater. But there was also the deployment of food stamps, which began as a deployment of commodity crop surplus. Anti-hunger was second on the list. First was moving the commodity crop surplus. Cut to World War II, all of a sudden that part of the government said, you know what, we can win the war with this surplus again. So the US rose to superpower status deploying its commodity crop surplus wheat. The minute World War II ended, they again had a glut, but they said this time we'll move it to win the Cold War. So all these new countries throwing off the shackles of colonialism on the continent of Africa, Pakistan, India, Iran, Egypt became dependent on US exports of commodity crop surplus. Egypt had been the breadbasket of the Middle East for millennia, and it started importing US wheat in the 50s. So all of the archives tell this story. Pakistan might have gone to Soviet Union, and the US pulled it into the capitalist realm through commodity crop surplus, and a very neo-colonial geopolitical deployment. 
So back at the USDA, the USDA by this point said, all you farmers, you're going to feed the world, but a very racist understanding of who the world was and how they would be fed. But meanwhile, in this get bigger, get out, ramp up the production, were the US farmers winning? No, because there was at this point, the parity programs were being gutted. And so the prices was collapsing. So by the late 70s, prices collapsed so low, it would have cost more to subsidize for export or to burn it or destroy it. So the 1980s farm crisis, and this was a tragedy that was so preventable, so foreseeable. And I think what's interesting about the 1980s farm crisis is that it mobilized a farm justice movement that had strong black leadership. But just to kind of give a recap of what the parity programs were, it was a rock solid price floor. And it was quotas, supply management, meaning mid-sized farmers were in, that was the goal, not big farmers. You actually couldn't be part of it if you were a big farmer. It was a quota system grain reserves to deal with the surplus, and non-recourse loans, meaning the farm is never the collateral. Designed for white farmers, but actually black farmers made use of it in a way that I'll show you in a moment, and cooperatives. So the black leadership in the farm justice movement is an amazing history. And the Federation with Mr. Zippert and Mr. Pennick were trying to excavate this history with Mr. Burkett. Jesse Jackson, the Rainbow Coalition, were in the heart of the struggle in middle America, a beautiful interracial uh, fight for supply management and fair prices. Um, with the farmer labor solidarity, with an international dimension of solidarity, they did not buy the Feed the World myth. They knew that that was an imperial sham. So the kind of excavating of this amazing 1980s farm, cr farm crisis and justice movement is so important for the movement now. Mr. Jerry Pennick, whom I've been working with, did a, a survey about the cotton growers in the Federation. Now granted, the cotton program was designed to exclude black farmers, right? But the farmers that were able to hold onto their land made use of the parity program to stave off racist purchasers. They said, we have the rock solid price floor. So it actually was a way to keep farmers on the land. So in this survey, the farmers themselves, these are Federation farmers said, the New Deal figured this out. If there's too much produced, then it benefits no one, least of all the farmers themselves. Overproduction drives down prices. There needs to be developed again the non-recourse loan system, which is a price support for farmers and a way for them to get a fair price to stave off the corporate price making. It's the farmers who need to make the price and the corporations take the price. The corporations should never be the price makers. They will drive it to pennies. They do every time. Without the farm program, it doesn't make sense to farm, the farmer said. And so Mr. Pennick and others in the Federation had a beautiful campaign for fair living wages. And also with Mr. Burkett and Mr. Ralph Page were leading the fight against the free trade, which was a wipeout of the supply management and the parity system. So cut to where we are now. The 1996 Farm Bill deleted all of the parity programs. It was neoliberalism. The WTO said, get, get farming out of, you know, government out of ag, let the free market do its thing. Of course, we know what the free market does. It drives everything to pennies. It cheapens the beautiful work of farmers. But the, his the secret here is that it looks like farmers are doing well, because there's like four white guys in a big combine, and it looks like they're rich. <laughs> Median farm income has been below zero since the 1996 Farm Bill. The money that they have is off farm income or the assets of the land. This is the secret, is that farm, farm debt, look how high it is right now. It's as high as in the 1980s farm crisis. And meanwhile, for black farmers, they're dealing with loans that are at terrible interest rate and getting rejected. So the debt is crushing for the black farmers. But the secret is that no one's doing well except for the corporate buyers in this situation. So you have this broader, now we get back to the farm bill and you see there's a secret here. The commodity title and the conservation title are the beating heart of the farm bill. It is the Great Depression, we're never gonna go back, and the Dust Bowl, we're never gonna go back. But once you start getting into nutrition and trade, those are surplus disposal mechanisms, you see. And then by the credit and rural development, those are when farming is no longer a livelihood for most people, there's poverty in rural areas. And so then you've got the Band-Aids, which is credit, crop insurance, rural development, which are beautiful band-aids, people are doing great work, but it is not really a dignified livelihood. People don't want charity, they want a fair price for their beautiful work. And so then you've got even energy is actually surplus disposal, renewable fuel standard. It's just a way to move that mountain of corn that nobody wants, except for the CAFOs who are doing quite nicely off that falsely cheap feed grain. 
And meanwhile, back here, you've got all the beautiful work of the anti-racist tucked into the crumbs of miscellaneous. Why not reclaim the commodity title, you know, for this great work? So what's all this, what's all this glut going? The US said, well, we'll just export this problem away. We'll just kind of export it away, meaning it's getting dumped on farmers all over the world and crushing their farm gate prices. So the entire massive line of exports moving up is leading to farmers around the world being crushed within their, within their own farm gate prices. And this actually birthed the food sovereignty movement in the mid 90s as a rebuttal to that neoliberalization of agriculture and the WTO. Mr. Ben Burkett was calling this out since the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s. He has tried to speak this truth to power in all of these ways. And globally, there's an entire movement to say food sovereignty is about keeping that price floor so that you can grow your beautiful culturally appropriate food and not have the commodities dumped on it, crushing all of the, of the viability. But meanwhile, the Federation has a different vision for trade. And I have been so honored to work with Mr. Burkett and Cornelius on learning from them as they have a new model of trade that is based in solidarity. So even Cuba, the beautiful work they're doing with all of the cooperatives in Cuba on forging a trade that is respectful of viability and agroecology. Um, and the other thing we've been working on is what if we reclaimed that parity program that was just for rich white men for a new generation of black and indigenous and farmers of color? Like if it worked for them, it's a precedent. It's been there for 50 years. So we have this disparity to parity project. Cornelius has written a beautiful essay, George Naylor, Mr. Ben Burkett. We've had a whole webinar series, Dania, Dolores Huerta, Raj Patel. Um, it's all on the website, you know, really thinking through the how and the what and the why of updating it. And while we were doing this, the, the largest protest in human history happened. The US government and, and media did not cover it for racist reasons, because India is actually twice the size of Europe and five times the linguistic diversity of Europe. It would be like all of Europe going out in the streets. 10 million farmers across the huge diverse country occupied Delhi for a year to demand minimum support prices, fair prices, and they won. They beat Modi, who's an authoritarian dictator. They won. The BJP was, was pushed back. And so they were right that actually, if there's not a fair price, then it is a washout. People will lose their land and there'll be an agri-corporate capture. So I'm going to pass the mic to Mr. Burkett, who is a mentor in all of this. And I'll just give a quick shout out. The American University Practicum students have worked all semester learning from these elders of the farm justice movement and have created a timeline to help us understand this complicated and forgotten erased history. I'll say it's erased by the corporate benefactors of this, of this situation. So it will be ready on the toolkit and on the Disparity to Parity uh, website. So Mr. Burkett, please pass on how we can think this through. I'd like to say good morning, everyone. Good morning. Not much for me to say. Dr. Lovelace <laughs> said it all. <laughs> but it's no, it's no wonder that the title one in the farm bill is commodities. And when you say commodity, that means cotton, corn, soy, bean, wheat, all the crops that supposed to keep this economy running. I've been fortunate to been. Uh, I'm a member of Cotton Incorporated, the Soybean Council, uh, the Corn Growers Association. All those associations make, maintain lobbies in Washington, D.C. So they really know how to work the system. So what we have to do is rewrite the system and how we do that. And Dr. Lovelace said parity, you know, you can't use that word in Congress tomorrow when you go visit <laughs> your senators and things. You have to use a new word. So all we talking about going to back to the thing that we used to do. I was fortunate enough in the 67, 68, and my family, the farm, the farm, you go down to the ASCS FSA office now and in 1968, my father took me with him to remove his name as operator and put my name on as operator. So my 40 years is just about up to take my name off and put somebody else's name. I don't see who name is going to be <laughs> <laughs> as the operator. 
but but at that time it was it, the ending of prepared and we was growing cotton we knew we, we had a stable price and all of a sudden they said we're going to take away all the prayers you can sell your cotton acres to a big farm in the mississippi Delta, and you get so much money so what that did that eliminated all the mid-sized farm and black farmers a lot of in my community in the 60s and 70s it was 40 black farmers now they're only two and what really drove a death nail into where we at was NAFTA. And NAFTA came along in 92, 93, up in that time. We had a contract with Blassett. We had a 1,500-acre contract for pickles. You all know the Blassett pickles among 800 farmers. So that means most farmers didn't have but one or two acres. Some had five. Some like me had 10. That killed all of that. We had contract with Tabasco sauce for red, long red cayenne peppers and jalapeno peppers, cucumbers for Mount Olive Company. So what that put all the farmers? And I'm talking about farmers that really relied on that their livelihood. Very few were working off the farm. So all the World Trade Organs, which should be abolished, I think, in my opinion, because all they do is make money for the corporations. So now you have probably full cooperation controlling 80% of the market. Archer down in the middle, Con Ag, one or two more. But on the other hand, you have the same control in the supply. Those of us that plant crops, you only have about four seed companies. And I'm talking about companies that control the whole world, not just the United States. They control the whole world when it comes to seed stock. So how, how can we better ourselves? And small farmers, and black farmers. And I see my good friend George on the, on the slide. He look as old as I do now. <laughs> <laughs> But George really taught me an awful lot about what we can do. First of all, we got to band together. And we got to come up with a whole new policy, a whole new way of thinking of agriculture. And we look at it from the standpoint, I, as I was talking with Dr. Lovely, I'm considered to be in the Gulf Coast trade area, 400 miles from Texas to Florida. And we look at it from the standpoint, we can produce everything we need in that 400 mile area. From energy, we have wind power. We have solar power. We have a great growing climate. So if we can look at how we can create those type of infrastructure all over the country, locally owned, locally controlled. And that way we have a foundation to build on. But now we are interdependent on the cooperations. You have four major supermarket chains, A-Hole, Walmart, Kroger's. They control 80% of the market. So the question is, how can we bring it back down to the local area? And I think we can do that with the momentum we have now. About 20 years ago, Kellogg foundation goal was to have 10% of all the food bought in these United States at farmers markets. That was a good beginning. And we was almost there until COVID came. So if we can go back to those type of things, you know, the farmers markets are great markets. And I go to two in New Orleans. Not so much for going to the market just to go to the city of New Orleans. A lot of time I spend more than I make. <laughs> but now the problem with farmers market is what? There's not enough farmers for the farmers market. So we get calls all the time from the Federation Cooperative. Can you have farmers in the country? So we got to rebuild the number of farmers, a whole new generation. But the parity program, and I, I can talk on and on, the best one was tobacco. 
the way it was structured, the way it was organized. Because it, it was a, a, a designed for farmers in Kentucky and the hills and the low lying areas of Georgia and South Carolina where you could have three or four acres and make a hundred thousand dollars. So now, and we had a big discussion in the Federation, John, no, whether we should support it, the tobacco buyout or not. I think we know that the seller that is because we had a lot of tobacco farming in the Federation at the time. The next one, which is still somewhat in place, is cotton. And you know, cotton is, uh, the acreage has been going down. But last year was a super year for cotton farmers. So those program design was, was based upon supply and control management, which simply means you only grow enough to meet the supply. And that way the price could stay high. But you had a government flow that it assured you of a fair price. So when they took off price control and did away with all the, and the, and the tobacco seller meant, mighty few small tobacco growers now. Peanuts is another good program with, with supply and control by the tonnage and by the production to the acre. But I only draw back to all of those programs that in the case of cotton, a white farmer farm jar and my farm, his base acre would be 1,300 pounds to the acre. Well, mine would be 515. How is that? Because the county committee determined the, fly, the acreage, pound to the acre. But again, we can redo the system and it's based upon you, the consumer, that drive the whole force. See, I like to win the well, no eggs. You remember not too long ago, what, about a year ago, eggs went to five and six dollars, five and six dollars a dozen. But we have we have a number of free range girls in Mississippi. They made great money. Brown eggs. So those things can is being done in silos. So we have to bring it to a national front for it to really, really work. And you know the land, food, is all that. I think that's a God-given right to quality food, fresh air, and good water. Thank you all.